Because of that mission, which I explained earlier, which is to grow the gifts unique in each child through the performing arts, the focus is the student. If a student is not practicing or progressing, then it's my job to figure out why and adjust my teaching. Maybe it's a lack of understanding. My job to change how I approach teaching, how to explain something that meets their learning style. Maybe it's a lack of motivation. My job to find out why. Maybe I need to change repertoire. I know, you know, sometimes it's just a song that can get a kid sparked. Maybe it's something going on in their lives and they're just too stressed or too overscheduled. My job is to make at least their weekly experience with me valuable for them. Hello, teachers. Welcome back to the Topcast, the official music teachers podcast. You're listening to episode number 193. I hope you're doing well wherever you are in the world. I know some people are starting to wind up for the year. Uh, some people are mid-term, like here in Australia, and uh, some of you are heading into summer. Some of you are heading into winter. So just about everything's happening. Um, what I do know is though that uh, some countries and studios are starting to emerge from the lockdown state, and people are starting to teach in person again, which is very, very exciting, of course. And and uh, we have talked about that on some of our YouTube videos and also in our membership about uh, how to go about that, some of the legal aspects, some of the things to consider. So there's, there is lots to consider. I know there's lots of um, uncertainty around the place at the moment, but look, hang in there. You're doing fantastic things. As I've always said, these are incredibly challenging times for any music studio. And I just uh, really implore you to do what you feel is best for you and your family and your own safety, uh, as well as speaking with your parents of your students so you can get an idea of what they want to do and then go from there. If you run a music school or hire other teachers to help you in your studio and have been wondering about how your studio might look past COVID-19 or in this new COVID-19 reality, then today's episode is going to be particularly helpful. I've invited one of our Top Music Pro members on the show today to chat about how he's evolving his nonprofit music school of about 400 students and 20 full-time staff over in New Hampshire, USA to a new post-COVID-19 reality. His 25-year-old school runs about 100 classes a week, including music, drama, dance, and they even have a licensed preschool. It's just phenomenal what they've built there. And all of those classes have transitioned online. And as he says near the start, he calculated that his school has run something like 2,000 online classes since the lockdown happened. Can you imagine the work it took to get that to happen? I know some of you also own big music schools, and you'll know uh, just how challenging that would have been. So in today's episode, we're going to unpack how he's approached uh, things like online recitals, how he built his school originally and how it got to be the size it is and be able to offer all the different things that it offers, um, the, the advantages of running a non-profit enterprise and also his mission to never let a student go. And I also wanted to mention that we have moved into June now, so we're starting a new theme on the blog and the podcast and YouTube and social, and that is sight reading. It's one of those skills that, look, it's not one of the most exciting things to talk about quite often, but we're going to do our best to make it as interesting as possible. But it is such a crucial skill for students. And I know that uh, some people who listen to me think that I only teach um, popular music and chords and things like that. But uh, in reality, I'm a very, very big believer in the power of sight reading. I've always been a relatively good sight reader, a much better sight reader than I am a performer and or memorizer for that matter and i really know the power of being able to sight read so we want to give you some resources on that and give you some opportunities to think more deeply about it and give you resources including things like our member workshop which will be over in top music pro from one of our fantastic sight reading uh, teachers and also blogs videos downloads and also uh, this week released our new top music sheets with the fabulous Jerry Ray. She's a composer from here in Newcastle, Australia. You might have been familiar with her musical Menagerie book. It was published by Alfred some years ago. Uh, she has another three books, and we've compiled the best of those three into Top Music Sheets Volume 2. It's available to all my members for free on any of our plans over at topmusicpro.com. So my guest today, as I said, is a Top Music Pro member. His name is Jeff Davison, and along with his wife, Anne, founded a multidisciplinary performing arts school in New Hampshire, US, where he's taught for 25 years. Jeff attended Berkeley College and New England Conservatory and studied with Dorothy Taubman. He currently enjoys playing in a reggae band in addition to teaching and running the nonprofit school. I don't know how he has time to do that. His school's called Bedford Youth Performing Academy. Welcome to the show, Jeff Davison. 
Thank you, Tim. It's really great to be able to talk with you again. And uh, you just mentioned that you, you've been a, a pretty long time follower of the show. So it's great to have uh, both, a, both a listener, but also uh, a Top Music Pro member uh, coming on the show. So thanks again for yeah. your participation in our, in our membership and your contribution to the forums. You've been doing lots of that, particularly while teachers have been moving online because you've got great ideas about that, which we'll dive into today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I feel like we just spoke on Facebook Live. Yeah, you know, I know. Well, it, 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 felt feels like like the other, it feels like the other day, but yet it feels like ages ago. I mean, so I much has gone on. So I know. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, so look, you're really innovating um, in arts education up in New Hampshire, uh, USA. So tell us about your performing arts nonprofit up there. Okay. So um, uh, our school is called Bedford Youth Performing Company, which we call BYPC. Um, it's a nonprofit performing arts school uh, founded by my wife, Anne and I, in 1996. So we're starting our 25th year this September. We're located in Bedford, New Hampshire, which is a town of about 23,000, um, which is a suburb of Manchester, New Hampshire, which is the largest city in New Hampshire, which is about 112,000. And um, we're like 60 miles an hour north of Boston. So that's right. our location. Um, we originally started as a musical theater company for middle and high school age students. And over time, we added music teachers and dance teachers and acting teachers and a state licensed preschool. And we're now one of the largest comprehensive performing arts schools in the New England region. Uh, we currently have over 400 active students, uh, 20 full time and part time staff and teachers. Um, eight instructors teach music and private lessons. And we currently have about 200 classes per week, which include private lessons. And almost all of our classes have transitioned to online classes since March 16th. So since the COVID pandemic shutdown, I did the math, uh, we've conducted close to 2,000 online classes and workshops. Wow. I mean, it's extraordinary how you've grown. Uh, I mean, it's taken some 25 years, but yeah, you've, yeah. Uh, I assumed you started with one student or two students in probably in a house or something like that. How did it, how, what was the actual inception? How did it look right at the beginning? Well, it started as a musical theater company. Ah, right. So we started doing musical theater. Um, our, our town did not have its own high school. And so we started doing musical theater. So yeah, we were like directing Oklahoma in our basement and I had like a, <laughs> a, a 20 piece pit orchestra in my basement. So I've um, played piano for that one well and truly and know just how much uh, boom, 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 yeah, yeah. Boom, there is all the way through. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Um, so I actually started as a performing arts school and then you added instrumental instrumental students later on. What sort of students do you, do you now work with? So what, what are the specific instruments or disciplines that they study? So we have programs and classes in music, private lessons, um, piano, voice, guitar, drums. We have group lessons, group voice lessons. We have ensembles, jazz bands, rock bands. Um, we are also licensed and certified for kinder music. We have a dance program. We have acting classes. We do musical theater productions. And like I mentioned, we have a state licensed preschool that has an arts-based curriculum. I personally have around 40 private piano and voice students per week. And I direct the music for our musical theater productions and I oversee the music um, program for the school. People could see me now, my jaw would be well and truly <laughs> on the floor. I don't know how you have time to even speak to me today, Jeff. I mean, this is extraordinary. Uh, well, thank you, you. You're not, not only teaching all these instruments and performing arts, but running a preschool with music feature. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later on because I think that's a whole okay. discussion. Okay. Um, I don't do the preschool. It, well, I don't do preschool. I should no, hope you I, don't because yeah, I no. can't imagine you doing all of that stuff. I mean, it's extraordinary that you're able to teach... Uh, over 30 students a week yourself with all of that happening. Um, it must be quite a busy schedule. Yeah. <laughs> you obviously love it too. What about, uh, what about your teachers? How many teachers do you have? Um, and how do, they, how, do, how do they work? Are they um, mainly sort of part-time? They just pop in for a lesson or two here or there. Um, let's talk um, not online. We are a school and we've built a team. You know, since we were since we were established as a nonprofit, so our school's a nonprofit, and since we were established as a nonprofit, we're founded on a mission. I mean, when you when you start a nonprofit, one of the requirements is you have a mission statement, and that's one of those things that a lot of business owners don't really think about is like, what is your mission? Mm. So our mission statement it says to grow the gifts 
unique in each child through the performing arts. Our focus is on the kids and we have a unique family dynamic and a strong community. And it's because of that, we've been able to keep going so strongly during this difficult time. We've worked very hard to create a valuable online experience for our students and we've stuck by our kids and our families have stuck by us. And it's really all about relationships. So, you know, I said, we have like 20 full and part-time people. Um, we've got some office staff and we've got some support staff, but um, all of those teachers are part of our team and part of a family and um, have been working their butts off right now to make sure that we're still successful and still uh, including the kids and including our community. So, Yeah, all the teachers the world around have been working incredibly hard in the last oh, yeah. few months. Um, it sounds like the fact that you are a nonprofit is truly in your DNA. What, what, made, you, what made you decide to do a nonprofit rather than a, an LLC or a company? Uh, I, you know, I'm trying to think. I think back to that sometimes, especially when, I, you know, I'm, I'm approaching age 60 and I start looking at retirement and I start thinking like, why did we do it this way? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, because, you know, as a non first of all, it's like, so nonprofit is not, first of all, nonprofit is not a business, business plan. Right. It doesn't mean that we don't make money. Um, and a lot of people think, well, nonprofit means that like you do stuff for free and you don't, you know, we are profitable. Um, but it means that you, you roll everything back into your business. Mm -hmm. It means that no, no person is the owner of the business. So we have a board of directors and the board of directors oversee, you know, have to approve our plans. But, you know, my wife and I oversee the business. We are in charge of the business. You know, we receive our salaries. You know, we pay ourselves. We pay our teachers. So... But it's not like, you know, we don't make millions of dollars every year, you know. Right. Um, so it's because a, a nonprofit, when we originally started, it was because we wanted to per, per, um, fulfill a mission, a, 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 a service to our community. And like I said, we started as a theater company and mm. a lot of theater companies are nonprofits. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and a lot of like schools will have like the school as the for-profit business and the performing company as the nonprofit business. Mm -hmm. And we looked into that model. The problem is that can get very complicated. So it's always been a nonprofit, but that doesn't mean that it just means we don't pay taxes. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and you don't have shareholders. I think that's, yeah. Right. The way, right. way it works. Yeah. We, no, you know, the shareholders of the community are, yeah. Are, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, it's interesting to discuss this because it's probably not something that many music teachers think about as a, an entity, a way to set up their music teaching entity, but it perhaps shouldn't be written off. Um, and certainly there's, there's nothing stopping any business owner having a mission, uh, but I can see how it's, right. it's, it is really essentially integral to what you do. Is It's about having a mission and that's, that's what the nonprofit gives you. So no, it's interesting yeah. to discuss that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the, the early learning thing. Um, and you've built, I think you've built your own curricula in order to provide these early learning experiences for students. Can you just tell us about that as well? Sure. So I personally have not built early learning curriculums myself, um, but our team has created, first of all, a unique um, arts integrated preschool curriculum, as well as a preschool dance curriculum that, may very well be licensed and marketed, but that's not my project. Mm. Um, and we also have become a kinder music school. So now, you know, our music teachers are all independent and teach to their individual strengths and musical style. So there's no curriculum to adhere to for the music program, but there is the mission to follow. Mm. So because because our programs are diverse, okay, let me tell because our programs are diverse, we do music and dance and theater and, and have a preschool, we've been able to adapt our program over the years to the needs of our community and to our market. So when we started, we, our town did not have a high school. So we started, um, our, our students went to the city schools in neighboring Manchester, or they went to private schools. So there was a need for a musical theater program in our community. So we did, like I said, we did mm. full scale musicals. We did West Side Story, Oklahoma, Guys and Dolls. I had a full pit orchestra. 
Um, we had an instrumental program. We had a big band. And about 10 years ago, our town built its own high school about a mile up the road from us. And so eventually the town built a very good quality drama and music program. And because of the high school, many younger families moved to town and there was an increase in immigrant families in our town. So our student base shifted. Mm. So um, if we tried to remain as just a musical theater production company doing shows with high school, we, we'd go out of business. Right. So we, we still do musical theater companies, but a lot of them now are the junior shows. Um, our focus is on the instruction. Our focus is now directed towards early learning. And um, it's, it's because of our market shifted and we could do that with our programs. You know, the beauty of that, first of all, is that families stay with us much longer of course, because yeah. we're starting our, our customer base. Our, I don't, you know, it's like now I'm doing the marketing thing. It's like, <laughs> no, but we start them much younger. They stay with us for years. And, mm. um, you know, honestly, this is another interview that you should do with my wife, Anne, because she's the one who has done the incredible job at adapting and creating programs, building our school over the years, doing the marketing um, and she continues today working with our team to develop online programs, um, which offer value to our students. And um, honestly, I just teach music. <laughs> <laughs> you I'm know? sure you're downplaying your role in this uh, somehow, Jeff. Well, um, that's, yeah. I, I, yes, I'm the creative force, but she's the, uh, she's the educational force, really, so... Well, I do want to pick up on the online thread now uh, because you've yeah, done a big okay. pivot to online performances. Uh, and I know you've had lots of questions about it. You've been asking us in the forums for other teachers, <laughs> you know, what do I do? What are you doing? Uh, and that's what that's all about. And yeah. I think you've, you've kind of come up with a bit of a plan. So what's, what are performances looking like in your school at the moment? And, or, or what are you planning to do in the coming months? So, um, you know, in the U.S., you know, we're approaching end of May, end of June. This is the end of the school year in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. so. so since our teachers, our um, music teachers, since our music teachers um, teach different instruments and have different, you know, age ranges and a different uh, student load, different enrollment levels, we decided against doing um, one school-wide model for online year-end performances and really let each teacher decide on the format that works best for them. So two of our piano teachers have around 10 to 12 students or under age 10. So what they're planning on doing is they're doing Zoom recitals with their students playing lives, playing live. And for those students that have poor internet or sound quality issues, those students will do a video and that performance will be screen shared with the Zoom call. Okay, um, so the teacher will screen share the video to everyone. Right. Great. Yeah. Um, and I've told each teacher, like, think about your students that have crappy internet or crappy sound, mm. record those. Um, so we also have group voice classes. Now our group voice classes have basically morphed into private voice lessons over the past few weeks because choral instruction is one of those things that we have not figured out a way to do effectively online. So mm. basically for those, each student is going to do a video of their performance. It's going to be recorded with like a backing accompaniment track. And they're going to do like a Zoom gathering. Some of the private voice students are recording videos with backing tracks. Um, one of our voice teachers is planning on doing everything live on Zoom because she has success with that in her grad school program. And so, you know, I said, as long as all of your students have good connections, you know, you can go for it. All right. We're looking into creating um, some unlisted YouTube playlists as a way of sharing studio videos and hopefully getting better quality sound results. Um, our guitar teachers are spending a ton of time because guitar students, my, my guitar teacher likes to say, guitar students don't play by themselves, like piano students. And it's like, well, he's not a classical teacher. Mm. You know, I mean, if you play classical guitar, then you do solo performances. But um, so he does like these ensemble recitals where he groups kids together drum student guitar student vocal student and he oh, puts together right. lots of little bands so he is doing a ton of work creating like backing tracks with bass and drums and each of the students are recording videos in some cases he's doing one of these virtual ensemble things where he's like 
having each student record their part and then he's compiling them into videos and he's going to do some watch parties with those. What I am doing is I'm dividing my students into three groups because I have 40 kids. So I'm dividing them into three groups. They're all recording videos. And um, what I'm going to do is upload them to YouTube and do YouTube live events for oh, each right. group of students. So, um, you know, we're all doing different things. Um, and then what we're doing is the instructions for each teacher's recitals, their video procedures, their file upload procedures, their dates, their times, links, and everything are all being posted on our website. We have a password protected page, which we currently have set up with every teacher's Zoom meeting links. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's all going on one resource to direct all the families to. So I don't I, know, I, lots of different. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that makes a lot of sense for a studio like yours with all these different elements going on. Um, I, I interviewed one of our other members, Nate Trepka, uh, about his he uh, he posted a, a studio ensemble performance on social, which I saw cool. and was blown away by. It was, it was fantastic. Sounds like what your guitar teacher is doing. But when we it's started, a lot of work. Yeah, when we started unpacking it, it's like yeah. I know video editing and I'm pretty good at it and I really enjoy it. So I was happy to do it. This is Nate speaking, but yeah, it did take me about 40 hours worth of editing work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, it, it does all those things we see performers doing on Instagram and uh, Facebook. They look great. They sound amazing, but they take a it lot takes of work. a lot of time. <laughs> and I've it told looks all easy, the, but it's not. I've told all the teachers, look, keep it simple. Like don't yeah. bite off more than you could chew. Um, you know, we've got a few people in house that are familiar with video editing. I don't do video editing. So I'm help. I'm asking other people to help me. Now mm -hmm. for mine, it's just like, start, stop, start, stop. I'm not doing You're video to mix multiple editing. People. Yeah. But, yeah. But that type of thing, I, you know, so I'm worried about the teachers, you know, coming to the second week in June and going, ah, mm, I'm right. not ready, you know, so. Yeah, and it sounds like you've um, really considered things like making sure everyone knows what they're doing, making sure the privacy concerns are, are all sorted out as well, um, things like that. Was, was there any um, discussion about that with your teachers about the plan or did you more or less sort of say, look, as long as you adhere to these guidelines, you can set how you do this? Well, we set our goals um, basically the same that we would normally do for a year end recital, but look sort of towards the online elements. So, you know, the goals were, you know, the recital is, you know, focuses on student, student accomplishment. Um, you know, the recital is a showcase of the students hard work, a school year completion, but encouraging students to continue through the summer and the fall. So it's like, this is the end of the year. Mm. Um, it being part of our school community, we want everybody to participate. Um, it needs to be reflective of everything that we're doing with the school. I mean, the dance programs and the acting programs and, and the preschool programs are all doing year end online events. And the other thing is that it had to be good quality and have good value because, you know, parents need to know that we're, you know, we're thinking this through. So, yeah. um, you know, as for privacy, uh, you know, we set some guidelines. I mean, you know, we said students have the option to be shown like hands only. Oh, yeah. You know, um, there will be no last names used in any presentations or any live or any video, no last names used. Um, any videos that are uploaded to a, a internet platform are going to be unlisted. Um, no links are going to be made public. And, you know, any parent that still has objections, you know, there's some parents that say, look, it's internet. I don't trust it. I don't. Mm. So we're having those teachers offering them like a private Zoom call, maybe with the family. OK, get your grandma on, get your aunt on. Mm. We'll do a private Zoom call if they want to join on. But that's, you know, so far, that's only been like a couple. Right. Yeah, um, I can imagine that. You know, I mean, yeah. as long as it sounds reasonable and it sounds like you've really thought it through and that's what parents want to know, uh, then that makes a lot of sense. 
This episode is presented in collaboration with our friends at Tonebase. Tonebase is an online music education platform dedicated to making the highest level instruction affordable to students, teachers, and amateurs around the world. The Tonebase Piano Artist roster features world-class concert pianists and recording artists like Garrick Olsen and Simona Dinerstein. Legendary musicians like Leon Fleischer, gold medalists of Chopin, Clyburn and Queen Elizabeth International competitions, as well as professors from top conservatories like Juilliard, Curtis, Eastman, Yale and Peabody. In a library of over 150 high quality in-depth videos, these artists share their insights with you on the craft of piano playing in all its breadth including tutorials on intermediate and advanced repertoire, workshops on technique and musicianship, as well as interviews and special features. As a privilege of joining Top Music Pro, members receive free, unlimited access to the Tonebase piano platform. Join Top Music Pro to experience the incredible resources Tonebase has to offer at topmusicpro.com. And for more information on Tonebase, visit tonebase.co slash piano. That's tonebase.co slash piano for more information. You've mentioned the audio and technical uh, considerations, particularly for students with bad internet. Um, mm -hmm. What about any copyright issues that you've had to think through? Uh, it was, you know, so, um, I mean, as for technical, my main concern is Zoom. Mm. Capital Z-O-O-M <laughs> underscore bold. <laughs> you know, I, you know from our, our interactions, Tim, that, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed with that. Um, mm. If I was a programmer, an engineer right now, that's what I'd be working on is a platform for, um, you know, good music sound. Actually, I've been testing, I've been doing a lot with clean feed. I'll fill you in on that. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Be yeah. It's been working um, pretty well. Um, um, you know, as for the copyright question, so both YouTube and Facebook have very active algorithms that search for copyrighted recorded material. Um, and if they detect something, they can mute your video or they can block it. And we've had a lot of recent experience with this in some of our dance programs, dance teachers mm. um, have posted videos with recorded music. Our Zumba instructor, instructor has had several videos taken down by Facebook, even though we have a license to use the Zumba music Facebook Right. Like took down. They didn't block it. They or mute it. They took it down. So okay. But I believe because I've been looking into this. I I believe this basically applies to recorded music files, because that's what the algorithms detect. There's not like some guy in a room listening to videos. <laughs> yeah. See if he, just okay. the kid playing uh, for Elise is ripping off somebody's famous recording. Yeah. All right. right. So, so if your student is playing a cover of like, you know, Billie Eilish and playing a piano, you know, version, I don't think you have to worry about YouTube blocking it. So the other thing is that any, you know, for any teachers doing this, any YouTube videos that you have should not absolutely not be monetized. Mm. And I think that if you're doing any kind of monetization on YouTube, you need to just set up a separate channel for your, recital you know just to keep that safe so mm. and the other thing is you know i doubt that nancy faber or jennifer eckland or dan lynn mcfarland are going to make any copyright claims against anybody posting performance videos of their compositions at, at least i hope not you know no, well, i mean look it, no. it makes sense for their own promotion i've always said that to publishers and and composers i mean people playing your music is a good thing Yes, but that's, you know, that's a huge conversation in the music industry right now. Mm. You know, I mean, and there are a lot of, there are a lot of people that just block their stuff because. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know whether it's because I have a business account or, or what or how YouTube is set up for me, but when I get a copyright claim, uh, it will, it doesn't normally block the video and it says you've, you haven't got a strike or something bad, but we're going to take some of your money. Basically, if you do have monetize, monetization taken right. uh, or turned right. on. So I think it's probably prudent, as you say, because they do, the algorithms do search through unlisted videos as well as listed ones for those. And what, one of the other issues that we all get annoyed by when we run live recitals is those parents who ring up just before and say, look, uh, little Samantha, <laughs> she's, got a, she's got a play date straight afterwards or she's got a ballet concert. Can she leave straight after she's played? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any 
uh, issues or advice on audiences leaving early for online recitals? Have you come across this? <laughs> yeah. Do you mind if she goes first? We yeah, that's go right. Yeah. Yeah, We've got to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, or the people who just sneak out after their kids yeah. play. And at the end of Even the night. Even though you've made you know, it clear. You know, um, I don't think there's much that you can do to prevent that kind of, I don't know, selfish attitude. I mean, and it's certainly not going to change with an online presentation. So, but I'm really not worried about it. Um, I've seen some teachers online that make like little quizzes or questionnaires or little scavenger hunts and, you know, to encourage people to watch the video to the end kind of thing. But you know something, one of the things that I did actually sort of getting ready for this talk with you was um, I recently asked several of students, like what, what's important to you about recitals? Mm. What do recitals mean Good to question. you? Because I've, you know, I think I thought about it a lot myself. What does it mean to me? What's it mean to my school? So I, I, several of my online lessons this week, I said, what's the recital mean to you? And one of the things that they all said was hearing the other kids, hearing right. the other students play. They like to hear the kids who are advanced. They like to hear the kids that are like, you know, been playing for years. They like to hear the kid who's like, three years younger than them, but like much better than, them, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. and, and they also get a kick out of hearing the, the younger students, like, you know, the kids that have played the song that they played the year before, mm. like, oh, you know, I, I remember, remember playing, doing that song. I remember doing, so, you know, I'm not really that worried about it. I, you know, I think the people that'll listen and the people that'll participate will participate. And, um, you know, the people that won't, they won't. And I'm not going to get crazy over like trying to plan my event mm. for that fact. So. Yeah, I agree. I yeah. think it's great uh, advice, Jeff, to ask your students and parents, depending on the topic, those kinds of questions. You know, what is it that you get out of this to, to work out whether what you're doing is valuable? Is it worth your time? Uh, and I think a lot of teachers yeah. as, countries are now starting to open up again a lot of them are asking you know, do i go back to in-person lessons how does this look uh and i think it's really important to i mean you've obviously got to make a decision that suits yourself but ask your parents ask ask them what they think about things i think it's really valuable yeah. we often forget it's a missing step we often forget to ask our students these questions because they're well, especially in this in this time it. yeah especially in this time you know we've decided what we're doing over summer but you know, September. So for, for us in the U S September is the beginning of school. Mm. And that is like a huge, huge question. Mm. You know, what are schools going to do in September? Um, and we're sort of planning two different tracks, but yeah, it's important. Like what your families want, you know, is everybody want to open up or is everybody want to stay chill? And, you know, so, um, yeah, I, we, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of talking to do with our, mm. with our students and with what, our families. What is your, your thinking of your two tracks? Is it sort of all, all on person or all online or perhaps a mix when you go back? For me personally, um, I'm really liking a mix idea, but um, yeah, but that gets into another, you know, a whole nother <laughs> topic. I mean, you know, online teaching has been a huge eye opener for me. Um, and I think you've seen some of my questions that I've put, you know, forth on the, on the forum, on the, mm. on the top pro music. It's, um, you know, maybe a combination. Honestly, I can't see myself sitting next to a kid, um, teaching a lesson, touching a piano, touching their hands, you know, sitting next to them before there are some real changes in, what happens as far as treating this pandemic mm, and, you yeah. know, um, you know, there's no amount of uh, Clorox wipes that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and face shields. And I mean, I mean, it becomes, it comes down to practicality in the end in, in yeah. many ways, doesn't it? It's yeah. like, yeah, there's, yeah. It's interesting. You know, how we're, we're doing some year end events for our school where we're um, setting up our parking lot. And for example, our, our preschool is having its graduation and the kids are, are, are there driving up. The teachers are putting a red carpet 
in the parking lot and the kids are driving up and the teachers are going to, with their masks on, are going to present them their diplomas and take their picture. And, you know, so we are That's doing fantastic. some, um, some sort of in-person stuff, um, but we're not opening our building up because we'd have to like clean our bathroom every five minutes. You yeah, know, so, yeah. 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 Uh, look, it's, um, I mean, it's, it, it would be great if we could all say, here's what you should do, but it, it, it really comes down to your area, your country, uh, how things are going for you personally. So I, yeah. I, I value you. I know you haven't set on a final decision on this, but I appreciate you yeah. being so honest with us just about your thinking. Yeah. So thanks for that. Yeah. Just on um, on leadership, I mean, you, you've got some incredible skills there to for both for you and your um, wife to have created what you have done. And as I said at the start, kudos to you. What a, what a what an amazing legacy to uh, to leave. Um, Thanks. One one of the missions that I think you have uh, at your um, school is to never let a student go, uh, which I I do agree with. But I've also had much. I've really been able to enjoy the fact that sometimes students do move on when you really can't make it work for them. So um, is, this, is this part of the whole school? You were talking about missions before. Is this part of that mission mm -hmm. or is this just your own personal um, idea? Yeah. So the, because of that mission, which I explained earlier, which is to grow the gifts unique in each child through the performing arts, the focus is the student. So if a student is not practicing or progressing, then it's, it's my job to figure out why and adjust my teaching. Maybe it's um, a lack of understanding. You know, my job to change how I approach teaching, how to explain something that meets their learning style. Um, maybe it's a lack of motivation. My job to find out why. Maybe I need to change repertoire. I know, you know, sometimes it's just a song that can get a kid sparked. Mm. Um, Maybe it's something going on in their lives and they're just too stressed or too overscheduled. And my job is to make at least their weekly experience with me valuable for them. Mm. You know, rarely have, rarely, rarely we may have let a parent go because, <laughs> because they cannot abide by our policies, but we have never let a, a student go. Mm. Um, and I just really feel that you know, my job as a teacher is to, is to meet the student on their level. And so if something isn't working, then I need to figure out why, and I need to adjust the way that I approach that student. Um, they're kids. Yeah. You know, they're it's, kids. it's such a, but, it, but it's, it's such a shift in, in the philosophy of teaching Jeff from, even 20, 30 years ago when the teacher was right always and knew everything and sure. you were to get in line and do what you were told. Uh, I mean, this has been a radical shift for you to, to, to say, I mean, not radical for you perhaps or for me, but um, for some teachers that, that thinking is quite different, I guess, to what they experienced as a child as well. And I think you're absolutely spot on. And, and um, part of the teen teaching course, which uh, we released this month in the academy, one of my handouts for that course is a, um, a, a, a student diagnostic for when they are starting to have troubles, basically. So you can just see they're not practicing, they're getting disengaged uh, and actually running through a whole series of questions with them about what that might be. Is it about the lesson content or the music or is it something to do with their family or friends? Yeah. You know something, teen, I, you know, I knew that your focus this month was on teenagers. Um, and actually my favorite students are my teenagers. Mm. You know, teenagers are, are young adults who are desperately every single day searching for their identity. They're trying to figure out who they are. Right. Mm -hmm. And and every single so for every single teenager, music is like a huge part of their life. So, you know, they're trying to figure out, like, am I an artist? Am I a writer? Am I an actor? Am I a soccer player? Am I a football player? Like, who am I? So, you know, I just see that um, music, you know, or the performing arts, because we also do theater, we also do acting. Is, is their opportunity to figure out like, who am I and what makes me tick and what gets me excited and what am I good at? What am I not good at? What, 
you know, um, I, you know, I just see that as an opportunity to really help these people grow into, you know, eventually, mm -hmm. hopefully healthy adults, you know, right. the music is the, the music for us, um, it is the medium. It's not the product. Mm. Nice way to put it. My, uh, my producer, Emily, who was chatting to you before, uh, in preparation for this interview mentioned something about a student named Austin. <laughs> she wanted, she, she thought I should ask you about him. Can you tell me about him? You know, that's, it's so funny. That was something that a Emily latched onto. So the point that I was making is sort of what I was just talking about. The point that I was making was, you know, sure. I have former students who are now professional artists who are performers, musicians, um, but more importantly is I have former students who are doctors and nurses and attorneys and physical therapists and music therapists and veterinarians and teachers and great parents and yeah, even economists. And, you know, I would bet that each one of you, if you were to interview them, could give you a story at how being a part of our school and having music and the performing arts as an important part of their lives growing up made a difference and contributed to the person that they are today. So um, it would be interesting to hear that story from someone who's now an economist, um, <laughs> right? but they all do. And mm. um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's about growing the, the person. And it, you know, it blows me away that um, I have former students that come back to our school with their little kids to have them take dance classes. Yeah, I don't fantastic. yet have, I have not yet had the student of a former student for my piano lessons, but that's coming in the it next. May, it may, yeah, it may, it may yet soon. come. Yeah. Um, just yeah. before we wrap up and I, I wanted to ask you about what the next 25 years might hold for you and your school. But before that, I, I did want to ask you about uh, your experience inside Top Music Pro membership. Um, you've been a member for some time. And as I said, great contributor. You are and answer lots of questions, ask lots of great questions as well. What, what, does, what does being a member mean to you and, and what, what kind of changes occurred to you as you've been connected with the group? So, so Tim, your program, Top, Top Music Pro, which used to be called The Inner Circle, um, has been very important to me over the past several years. A few years ago, I was feeling some serious burnout and questioning how and even if I wanted to continue teaching. Um, and I found your site, you know, I did a lot of searches, I find your site, and several of your resources gave me a fresh perspective on many things that I was already doing as far as teaching contemporary piano, but it gave me a whole new take. You know, like four chord composing, even though I hate it, it's, <laughs> Well, that's okay. I'll tell you why. It's okay. the fact that so much contemporary music now is based upon these four chord formulas right. is in some ways depressing, but I get it. <laughs> I'm glad but, you're saying that. And I thought you were talking about my, my course. That's no, 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 okay. <laughs> no. But that court, it's been a great lesson tool and it gets kids engaged and it gets kids excited. I mean, I've been talking about music theory, diatonic chords, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, build the chords, let's put them together. But um, your course just made me like, think about it in sort of a new way and it energized me. Um, but I, you know, the real value for me has been the connections that it allowed me to take with other teachers. And I think, you know, last year I got to know Leela Viss Mm -hmm. and Bradley Sowash, and their insights and ideas has given me a, a tremendous boost to my teaching practice. And Leela actually helped me quite a lot last year um, as I worked to transition my private students from 30-minute lessons to a longer format. So mm -hmm. it was through that connection that I was able to find them and meet them. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, during this time now, transitioning to teaching music online. Top Music Pro has been an incredible resource. Um, the back and forth I can get talking with other teachers, talking with you, talking with Nicola, um, and through the forum has been really valuable in helping me figure out how to teach online and how to do this and has gotten me thinking about, you know, what's next. 
you know. Mm. So oh, well, it's wonderful to hear. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing that. Well, yeah. thank you for what you do. <laughs> Pleasure. I, and I say that in my messages to you is thank you for what you do. So. Uh, it is my pleasure. I do. I, lo- I love what I do. So it's great to be able to connect with you and, and hear those kinds that's of an, stories. Let's uh, let's just wrap it up with. Um, have you got any glimpse into the next uh, the next twenty five years leading up to your fiftieth anniversary of your school? Oh or man, you I don't know. Oh man, I don't know. Do you know? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> you know, so much has changed. So much has changed. I, you know, I do have to say, given uh, teaching music online has given me a new perspective, has opened up more possibilities. Um, you know, it's funny because um, uh, Emily asked me about, you know, mentoring. Have you thought about mentoring? And and she even said to me, this, you know, you can edit this out, man, because this is embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> she said, she said, wow, Jeff, you remind me of Marvin Blickenstaff. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I was like, holy crap, don't say that. I mean, I've, I've met Marvin Blickenstaff, and Marvin Blickenstaff, is, in my opinion, is one of the greatest p- modern piano pedagogues. So yeah, amazing. please yeah. don't put me in that category. But, you know, it does, it has made me think that, um, you know, maybe my experience and perspective after 40 years of teaching and performing music may, you know, actually be of interest and value to others. Mm. Um, I'm, you know, I'm turning 60 this year, so I, I may very well be thinking about new directions in my, what I do. Um, yeah. I've been thinking actually about writing a, a, writing something, maybe a book about my experience with Dorothy Taubman. Oh, right. Um, oh, have you had experience with that approach as well? Um, I studied with Dorothy Taubman. Oh, I had no idea. There you go. Well, there's another story because I... That um, might, might uh, be another story for another podcast, actually. Uh, I, I, did, I did have a repetitive stress injury and I lost my ability to play the piano for 10 years. Wow. Okay. And I, and I took lessons for two years. Um, I, I, I traveled from Manchester, New Hampshire to Brooklyn, New York every Saturday for two years and um, took lessons with Dorothy Taubman. And, wow. Um, she taught me how to play the piano again. And so. Amazing. Um, I had no idea. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the influence of Dorothy uh, continues to this day in so many people and approaches. And I've, I've been supported by a Taubman teacher before. Uh, like it's just yeah. remarkable. Yeah. Oh, it's phenomenal. So I don't know. I'm, I'm still thinking about the future. I don't know. You want to hire me? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about it afterwards. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, super, super to connect with you, uh, Jeff. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. I, I don't, I honestly don't know how you have the time to chat or to teach so many students with all that you're doing. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations on all the successes of the last 25 years and I look forward to hearing what comes next. Thank you. Thanks. All all the best. We'll speak soon. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's chat with Jeff and uh, hopefully it's inspired you to consider the possibilities of what you might be able to achieve if you did want to grow a bit of a bigger studio, but certainly what you can achieve just with your own studio and school uh, in regard to online recitals and things like that. Our Top Music Pro members can get access to the online recital webinars we've got and also our recital cheat sheet, uh, which was created just for online recitals by some of our team members here, which has been great. So next week on the podcast, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about masterclasses. I learned a heap from watching master teachers teach when I was just getting started as a full-time piano teacher, when I really decided that I wanted to go all in on this thing called piano teaching, I went and watched every single masterclass I possibly could here in Melbourne and also online. And um, I must say, it always annoyed me how these incredible teachers could play anything without the music at any stage of the piece. I mean, it was just extraordinary. And I'm sure many of you have felt the same. It really does make you feel quite inadequate as a, as a player when you can't just jump into a Chopin ballad with no practice and play the hardest bit in the middle. But anyway, this is what these teachers can do. That It's just phenomenal. Um, but with restrictions to in-person events, the timing couldn't be better for a platform to emerge featuring high-quality HD masterclasses, lectures, lessons and workshops with some of the world's best performers and teachers. I'm talking the likes of Garrick Olson, Leonard Bernstein and uh, Leon Fleischer and many more. 
The platform's called Tonebase, and next week I'm going to be interviewing Ben Lordy, he's the head of piano there, to unpack how the platform can help students and teachers. And also, I'm going to be launching a very exciting partnership between our two organisations. If you are a Top Music Pro member, you're going to be wanting to listen to next week's episode. I can't wait to share it with you. I'm Tim Topham, and you've been listening to the Topcast from topmusic.co. See you next time. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. You'll find everything you need for your studio, from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.